Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, you're joining a webinar entitled Reaching Out to Families, and this is being conducted by the National Center on Parent, Family, and Community Engagement. Before we begin, I, there are three presenters that will be uh, speaking with you today. I'll start us off. Uh, my name is Judy Sikora. I'm the Director of Family and Community Engagement at Child Care Aware of America, and I'm part of the National Center for Parent, Family, and Community Engagement team. Nancy, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everybody, or wherever, whatever part of the country you're in, whatever time of day it might be, welcome. Um, we're excited to be here with you, and we miss being able to get together in person and coming around and, and meeting with you. So we're hoping that through these webinars that we're doing, we're still um, connecting with you and sharing valuable information. So welcome. And hello, everyone. This is Jennifer Olson. I'm out in Oregon amidst, amidst lots of hazardous air and uh, wildfires that are settling themselves down. So I apologize if I have a little cough. I, I uh, That's just part of my atmosphere, literally. I'm also thrilled to be here today. I'm with the Parent Family Community Engagement Center and really looking forward to sharing these resources with you today with my colleagues. Back to you, Judy. Thank you, Jennifer and Nancy. So as we begin our webinar, um, there's quite a few of you on the line that are joining us today as part of our team. So we would like to take a quick poll and could you please tell us what your role is? And then we'll share the results of that poll. Just to repeat, if you're just joining us, we're gonna start off our webinar with a poll to find out what your role is in the early childhood community. If you could please select one of the drop downs that are on the screen and submit that, then we will share the poll results with all of us. <clears throat> we'll wait just a couple more minutes for people to put their vote in. Okay, so let's look at the results here. We have regional and local CCR in our staff. There's quite a few here, over 20%. We have a good representation from TA Center staff, and quite a few of you are mentioning other. So um, that's, that's quite interesting, more than half of you. We have some state, territory, or tribal CCDF administrators, welcome, as well as your CCR and our state network staff, and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so we have our group today. Our team is mixed with uh, quite a number of you that play very, very different roles. So that'll, that'll make for some very interesting thoughts and sharing today. Just a quick note, when you complete the webinar today, you will be um, sent a link to complete a post survey. This is a SurveyMonkey link. Um, it's, a, it's very important information for us because the feedback that you give us literally helps us design and um, change and extend uh, what we offer to you and how we offer it to you in our webinars. So the, the value, it's just, it's just invaluable to us. Um, we hope that you have about 10 minutes to please participate. We usually have very, very high response rate for our post surveys, usually set more than 70, 75% of all our attendees usually give us some information. So um, please 
take that time if you have it and please give us that feedback. Also too, um, who has access to this information? Really the information only goes to the three of us, Nancy, Jennifer, and I, and the evaluation team at Brazelton Touchpoint Center to help us inform um, our future materials and how we present them to you. So let's spend a couple of seconds looking at this webinar and what we plan to cover with you today. We're going to provide an overview of the Family Outreach Series, which includes four different documents that are available online, and we're gonna be giving you that information too, the link for that. The Strategies for Outreach to All Families, the overview document, as well as uh, the document that focuses on families experiencing homelessness, and the Strategies document that focus on focuses on families with limited English proficiency, and also to the strategies document, working with families living in remote or rural areas. We're going to explore some strategies for reaching out to families in a virtual setting. Um, we all know that we're, you know, we're all working in a virtual setting now, so um, a lot of our co-presenting, the comments that Nancy, Jennifer, and I are making will be with that in mind. We're also going to share some strategies to support the development of strong relationships and effective family engagement. I will tell you at this time, just a little addition, some of the slides that you're going to see um, during the webinar today are chock full and very robust with a lot of information. Our intention is not to cover, cover every single bullet that you may see on the screen. Uh, every single word or phrase. The, the purpose, and we did this very thoughtfully, is so that you can see a lot of the, the visual representation of the information, exactly how it looks when you open up the documents online. So you have that visual familiarity with the resources when you do find them online. Um, and our purpose today is to really give you some examples and a lighter touch on a lot of the content that's going to be covered. We, we want to cover mentioned most strategies, if not all of them. And we also realize that we have a time limitation. So we're going to uh, gracefully do that for you today. I do want to mention that all of the resources on family outreach that are on the CCTA website um, are correlated with the CCDF requirements and the final rule. We are not going to take the time to discuss uh, that information with you today, but please know that all of the CCDF final rule requirements are listed and written into all the resources when you do a deep dive and you find them online. So let's go to the Family Outreach Series, the four documents that I had mentioned to you. And as I said, they are all online available to you. There's This is the first time of several times where you're going to see uh, this mentioned. This is the, affectionately, we call it the CCTA website. It's the Child Care TA website to the Office of Child Care. And here are the four documents that we're going to be discussing today, and we've pulled out the strategies to discuss with you. The outreach document, the document focusing on families experiencing homelessness, families with limited English proficiency, and families living in rural remote areas. These are the covers of the documents as, they, as you will see them online. So I'm going to walk you through the first document, Strategies for Outreach to All Families, the overview document. When we think about outreach for families, we tend to focus on increasing awareness of available services and, and promoting use of those services with, with families that we serve. Early childhood and both school age professionals conduct outreach very intentionally, seeking out families and ensuring that all families are included. And of course, in the new landscape that we work within, we've had to reinvent ourselves, as we all know, um, figure out new strategies or implement strategies that were lesser used prior um, to our current situation. So we've all, we've all been very creative trying to connect with our families. So some aspects of outreach to families are collecting and analyzing data, um, of course, with the purpose of identifying families that are not being reached and sharing relevant information within our agencies and also too with our community partners if we have um, data agreements. Promoting culturally and linguistically responsive activities, 
that can raise families' awareness about high quality programming and services, uh, other comprehensive supports that will help boost and support family well being. And also, too, we want to promote research based practices as much as possible as it relates directly relates to child development and to learning. So, what does the re re research say to us? Many families, potential consumers, right? May, may perceive services as hard to reach because services seem to stigmatize or not and are not aligned with what families value. We, we, we know that. Um, we ha we've had that within our experiences. If that's a common ground. Families also may choose not to access services um, that are not promoted or delivered in ways that are culturally or linguistically responsive. Um, and because of, of some of that research and what the research says and what our, our experiences have been, this statement here is really, these two statements are the cornerstone um, that was the development point for all four of the resources that we put together and, and created on family outreach. And that is that, let's think for a moment about the fact that families may not be hard to reach, but it may be that our, our services are hard to reach. This speaks to the greater discussion about parent voice, family voice, um, and our, our listening skills as it relates to what families need and also how they would like to receive that information that they need. And here you're going to see there are actually 10 strategies that are mentioned in the overview booklet. Now, you'll see this on the screen and say, you know, oh, that's kind of small, I can't see it. We're not going to, at this particular moment right now, discuss each one of these. I am going to briefly discuss each one of these strategies, but I wanted you to see how they're laid out in the booklet all together in an array. And this is exactly how you will see it in the, in the overview document. These are all 10 strategies. The first strategy is prioritizing outreach and work to build a shared understanding of outreach. So it's important to adopt a definition of outreach, right? Any of the work that we do, we have to have a common ground, that shared definition of what, what, what is this, and make that determination. And we also want to focus on data-informed, consistent, but yet flexible. We don't want to be rigid, sustainable, creative, and also holistic approaches that consider the whole family and, and all their needs. We want to seek parent input and we want to consult with cultural and community organizations that partner with families. And this has to do with the parent voice and the family voice and being sensitive to uh, cultural needs and the ways that we can access family and also understanding and having dialogues and partnerships with community organizations helps us do that. We want to allocate resources and funding for outreach, identifying existing funding sources that might have some flexibility, and we, there's some mentioned here and in the resource, exploring opportunities for new funding, for example, partnering with other agencies, you know, sharing human capital uh, together we're better, and, and having shared partnerships. Creating a data informed, a data informed outreach plan and embed into your agency's overall communication plan. So um, your out outreach plan really is part of your communication plan. You want to use the data to identify families you want to reach, and then you want to identify the outreach strategies that might be effective. Also to consider, and this is relatively new for some, exploring data sharing agreements among organizations or among stakeholders. Number four, develop or enhance no wrong door or one-stop one shop policies and procedures and processes. Exploring opportunities for multi-agency teams or cross-agency staff roles. Um, also tapping into partners' existing relationships with families or groups of families. This is about, you know, together we're better and, and learning from other agencies and, and, and their creative approaches to accessing and working alongside families and supporting what they need to do and want to do for their families. And the collaboration aspect, collaboration with other agencies to set and work toward goals, common goals. 
And of course, we know this more than ever now, the use of technology um, and staff with technology to reach a broader scope of, of families and also specific audiences that we would really like to work with. Number five is dedicate and train staff to be family liaisons of parent ambassadors. That might mean um, hir hiring or engaging parents to be liaisons or ambassadors to other parents and families. Um, also to ensuring that staff and liaisons and ambassadors have strong listening and relationship building skills. Number six, learn what service features are important to families. Collect and analyze data from the families you work with or hope to engage in order to discover what families value. Um, consider creating messages that explain to families the value of applying for services, even if there is a long wait list. For instance, you know, explaining to a family that being on a wait list is important because it gives information regarding how many families are waiting for services and what that might mean down the road for them and for the community of other families as well. Number seven, explore and respond to families' cultural perspectives. Describe your agency's commitment to being inclusive. Um, we should pay attention uh, to cultural messages conveyed through our dress, etiquette, routines, and expectations from various cultures, and also to explore how you might engage past program participants as staff or as parent ambassadors. And then it's really important to make sure that all staff and ambassadors have very strong listening skills and relationship building skills. Number eight, create outreach that are positive and strengths-based. Um, we've kind of referred to that a little bit earlier when we talked about relationship building skills, but make sure in terms of training staff and liaisons or ambassadors that they are trained in strengths-based attitudes and relationship building skills and listening skills. When we focus on families, we have to, it's, it's important, we don't, it's important to consider that parents are decision makers. They're also resourceful users of services their trusted resources of information for, uh, for their own family and also other families and their friends so they can communicate a lot to others. And they're also leaders in their own right. Number nine, use consistent plain language and outreach messages. Consult the federal plain language guidelines. Those are very readily available online if you're not familiar with them. Be concise with your language and be clear and it's important to also write as we speak in a, in a conversational tone because that will be really, really uh, most helpful and most supportive of, of the variety of families that we're working with. Consider a literacy and reading level. And also, you know, our educational jargon is, is commonplace for us. We use it every day, but it's not, not as understandable uh, or discernible by others that are outside of our field. So it's important to make sure that uh, we don't use the educational terms that we use every day in a work setting. And number 10, use a variety of communication channels. Um, select channels and media that are based on how effectively each connects with families you hope to reach. Uh, this, of course, based on your partnerships and your other work with families, you will find out more and talking to families individually, you'll find out about what is their preferred way of communication. Now, some families love texting on their phones. Some prefer other, you know, some like to go online to websites, some like phone contact. You know, at, in this new environment that we're working in, we've been forced to really use some of those other communication venues as our primary ways to connect with families. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there's been a lot of, we've had other webinars where we've talked about, you know, what we've learned through, through all those communication venues. I'm going to now turn it over to Jennifer, and she's going to take us through the next resource. Jennifer? Thank you so much, Judy, for that great overview that's in that first overview booklet. And now we're getting into the actual resources themselves. And the first one that we're going to share with you today is Strategies for Outreach to Families Experiencing Homelessness. And we do know what a difficult group this can be to reach sometimes. And I want to reiterate what Judy said earlier about often it's not the 
the, the families are hard to reach, it's that they don't have access to us. And so we're going to uh, can discuss some strategies on how to help families who might be experiencing homelessness uh, um, have access to our services. So with all of the resources, we kind of start with a definition. And as you can see, this is our definition. It's a circumstance that families may experience when they face such challenges as extreme poverty or lack of affordable housing. And we really, really want to stress that situation that it's a circumstance that does not define a family. It can be also occur when it's unsafe or unstable. And in this environment, it could create a vulnerability for children and families and ex exposes families to physical, mental, and developmental risks. But I want to go back to the fact that it doesn't define a family. It's a circumstance which is changing at all times, and it does not define the family. Um, we also want to kind of think about what families may be experiencing when they're in this um, new status or current status. Um, they may not see themselves as homeless. Um, they may see themselves in transition. They may see themselves in an opportunity for change. Um, they may see that um, they are part of a, um, a culture that lives together, that comes together, that supports one another, particularly during this time of uh, COVID, you know, where they are living and working together um, because of cost. And they may not see this as, as a hardship. They see this as support for one another um, in, in their livelihood and support for taking children, care of children. So um, they, um, they also may experience barriers such as wait lists. So some families may have already tried to be to reach um, to have subsidies, um, but they encountered barriers. And so um, they, they um, have kind of given up on the system, uh, if, if I may say it that way. They could also fear that their children might be removed from their custody if they reveal that their housing situation may be challenging. So these are kind of a lot of things to kind of set the stage um, for when we work with families that are experiencing homelessness or might be facing a homeless situation. And so we want the booklets kind of set the stage, if you would, by the definition, then um, coming close to what families might be feeling. And then the third thing is that we really want to emphasize the regulations and the McKinney-Vento Definition of Homelessness Children and Youth Act. So right there in that resource is the um, definition, so you can have access to it right there, and you don't have to go looking it up and worrying about if you have it um, correct, and you can read it right there on the screen. And this is kind of a tempting definition to take apart, isn't it? because I think many of us know individuals, particularly in, in rural remote settings, that may live in trailer parks on foundations, and that is a very substantial and safe home for them. So we have to remember that sometimes we have to interpret this act and the definition a little bit, and that comes in our sensitive conversations with families, where we ask them about their living situation rather than assume their living a situation may be unsafe or unstable or inadequate. Here's the rest of that definition. In this one, we're kind of emphasizing that it's a public or private place not designed for ordinary use. Or families, unfortunately, who may be living in cars, parks, public places, abandoned buildings. And of course, we don't want to forget our migratory families who qualify as homeless. They're living, maybe living in circumstances um, that that are vulnerable or that are crowded, um, or in this case with the pandemic, we know they may not be um, able to social distance. Okay, so here we have, as Judy said, here we want to show you exactly what the resource looks like. So you see these visuals, and I hope that you can read them. Um, and I want to kind of make them come alive to you a little bit. So as we start to think about the strategies for outreach to families experiencing homelessness, I want to present you with a possibility of what you might be experiencing right now, okay, in your daily lives. So let's say that you have a group of families um, who have needed to go because of the virus or because of a variety of circumstances or because of unemployment, 
Um, there are many more um, families in shelters than you have previously noted in your community. And as well as that, schools aren't coming back into focus. They're uh, offering virtual services for children. So you picture you have more families living in perhaps shelters than you had before, and you have children who need access to um, computers for virtual learning. You learn from the shelters that they only have very few computers available to families. So you look around kind of close by and you think, well, there's a library nearby, but uh-oh, the library is only allowing 20 people in at a time. So how are we going to help these families um, who need um, laptops and access to computers for, to support their children in virtual learning? Well, you hear in the newspaper that Walmart and Target are interested in donating laptops to families um, in need. And you think to myself, oh my goodness, this is such an opportunity. Maybe they don't know about the homelessness shelters um, for families, um, families experiencing homelessness, and how can you get that information to them? So let's just stop and think for a moment about which one of these strategies you might use to reach out to families to let them know about this wonderful opportunity. And you might sit there at your desk musing through the resource thinking, which one of these hmm, might be helpful? Well, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and take you forward to number four and let you see what might be there. So I would use coordinate and collaborate with new and existing partners serving families to expand outreach across systems. Here's where you're thinking about all the people that may touch these families' lives and how you're going to get that information about access to free laptops and how they might apply for them to those families. So you explore opportunities for multi-agency teams and cross-agency staff roles to think about all the different ways that you can share this information. If a family comes in looking for, because of food insecurities to a food bank, Maybe someone there can share the information about how to apply to access these laptops. Tap into partners' existing relationships with families. So our child care providers may already know that these families are now in this new circumstances and are needing the laptops and their trusted partners that our families will reach out to. Identify and reach out to partners at the state level and the local level. You know, you might be able to local news, local newspapers, Lots of different opportunities. So you see the richness now of the examples of the um, of these uh, of this information. Let's go back to number three. So this one says work with the families themselves in your service area to identify meaningful outreach messages. So here is, you're seeking input from families. So you might go to the local shelter where you already have a relationship with the shelter staff at that shelter and ask if you can interview a few families about what's the best way to get out this information. Is there word of mouth that the families um, may be able to share with one another about access to laptops? Um, is there text messaging that's going on for families that are um, uh, in an, you know, coming into the shelter at certain times of the day or night. And so you can use that texting to let them know about the laptops. So here you see where you're starting to get ideas through these strategies on how to meet particular situations um, that you are living with right now in your community. Let me go back to those beautiful strategies here all laid out in this colorful platform. So another one is, let's say that the, um, the, the families that have moved to the shelters recently may not know about subsidies, okay? So how are we going to think about how we get information out to families about access to subsidies? Let's look at number five. Again, I apologize for jumping forward, but we want you to see everything that's on here. Consider ways that staff in both systems and program levels feel confident and prepared to be responsive to families. Okay, so strengthen the skills that staff need to have those sensitive conversations with families. So they might be going out um, to have lunch or a meal um, with a mask on, of course, with the families at the shelter, and they wanna be prepared to have the sensitive conversations that I mentioned earlier about how to ask families questions, how to sit and listen to the family tell their story, rather than coming in with a checklist and saying, is this your living situation and is this, this, and this happening to you? And of course now you're eligible for a subsidy potentially. 
Um, so we want to sit down, have conversations, ask families what's happening in their life, um, what are some of the circumstances that led them to be in the shelter. And through that, we can learn better about whether or not this is a very temporary event, and they have a very, very stable house to return to, that this is a temporary event because of unemployment or because of uh, essential workers you know, being laid off for a few weeks, and this is only a very temporary um, situation. Make the decision-making tool to determine a family's homelessness situation readily available to staff. So when we think about this leads to that, there's a decision-making tool in our um, resource that helps you kind of look for when you're listening to a family, kind of check in your own mind, not a checklist, but in your own mind, be ready to determine whether or not that family's situation meets the definition, the McKinney-Vento um, definition. Include trainings about the benefits and opportunities of partnerships with other staff and agencies. Again, you can enlist the staff at the shelters to have these sensitive conversations as well and to share information and introduce them to the possibility of reaching out for other resources and, um, and have information perhaps in writing about applying for subsidies. So I'm going to go backwards again. And you'll see there's six strategies. We have the first one is to build a shared understanding of outreach and the importance of outreach to families experiencing home homelessness. And that one is just critical that everyone has the same definition. Everyone has the same sensitivity to interacting with families who are in these circumstances. And everyone understands that that circumstance does not define a family. Second one is compile community data to inform your outreach plan. And that's absolutely critical that you're aware all the time of the shifting community data. And of course, we need to have our partnerships, which is number three, to be sure that we are aware of community data as it shifts and change. Four is coordinate and collaborate with new and existing partners, as we mentioned earlier. Five is consider ways to ensure the staff are both system and program levels feel confident we mentioned that one earlier too. And six is explore ways to coordinate services and address potential barriers related to documentation. Okay, so now I'm just going to move slowly through these. And as you can see, there's a great deal of information on this. This one I find interesting in that one of the additional strategies is to explore data sharing agreements. And as you're thinking about evaluating your efforts, you want to be sure that you're able to share data. Another important reason to share data is, of course, that it's more universal for families. They have to repeat their story less frequently when you're sharing data. I'm just moving through these now. We've looked at some of these already. And the last one, meet families where they are, where they're staying temporarily, and where they might feel free to go to. Streamline application process. Consider how you and your partner agency might work together. So you see the richness and the detail of this resource. Uh, it's really exciting. It started out with a general definition of homelessness, and then it went into a very specific um, impact on the family, then into the formal legal definition of, from the McKinney-Vento Act, and then into these six strategies with lots of exciting um, examples of how to coordinate and collaborate and work with families. Nancy, did you have a comment? Yes, Jennifer, yes. you were talking to me of a, a story that we heard when we were presenting in person um, about a program that worked with their staff to be able to have conversations with families without ever mentioning the word homeless. And there's been some conversation going back and forth in the Q&A today about what is the best way to refer to families experiencing homelessness. And this particular program had come up with a strategy where they could ask questions about housing circumstances without ever mentioning homeless. And when the family would say, well, why do you need to know my living circumstance? And they say, well, you know, um, depending on what it looks like, you might be able to qualify for some additional benefits or services that we'd be able to give you. So it's it's building on a strength and it's building on the circumstance of the family as an opportunity as opposed to a deficit without ever having to define them as homeless. 
It just came, it came to my mind when you were talking. I remembered that story. Oh, Nancy, th thank you so much. And um, I'm remembering uh, at a conference that we were at where we actually role played, um, we turned to one another and role played on a family telling a story and and uh, with just by active listening, really a attentive listening. When you ask a family, tell me about your situation and, and your children or tell me about tell me about your family. It's amazing what comes out and you don't have to ask those bold questions and uh, that make the, that are not strengths based um, and then uh, offer information as you suggested, Nancy. And as we role played it, we really found it was fun. You know, you found that you could stay away from those hot questions and uh, qu and stay with that strengths based approach. Hmm. And people are always ready to tell their story when they when they feel they have a, a compassionate, caring, listening ear. So much better to hear the story, as you said, than to, to have a checklist of questions. Mm -hmm. I've actually worked with a state, Nancy, where um, their subsidy workers are required to take um, a scenario, you know, where they practice a scenario where in a 12 minute conversation, um, they learn they're looking for in that family story, they're looking for um, uh, opportunities to suggest resources, food mm -hmm. insecurities, housing, uh, clothing, employment, uh, education, and that it's a conversation that the family yeah. the family makes an offering and tells the story, and you follow up with where they are about um, information and resources, and not with this brochure, as we all know, right? Oh, right. Not just handing them a brochure, but but also making sure there's a warm handoff. And we haven't touched on that yet, Nancy, but that warm handoff is absolutely critical in this circumstance, where families may be struggling and experiencing so much, and then also finding themselves in a situation where they could be considered homeless or in a shelter and in crisis. And so when we share information about resources, again, there's that great sensitivity and being personal with the family and that here is a brochure, this is the phone number, this is the email, but when you call or you email, ask for uh, Sandra because she knows me, I know her, and she's just the right person to talk to in this situation. In fact, I'll probably, if it's okay with you, email her ahead of time so she's expecting your call. Anything else, Nancy, before I move on to our next resource? No, that was wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> well, we, we, we're our own best cheerleaders, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so here we are. Strategies for outreach to families with limited English proficiency. Okay, so let's think about this one. Let's. It's gonna have some of the same design as the first one. So we're gonna look at this. Keys to effective outreach. So here we're going from the general or the broad perspective um, and down to the, we'll be looking at some very specific strategies as we move through this resource. So culturally and linguistic responsive interactions with families are, that's a tongue tire, respectful, reciprocal, and responsive. And I'm sure that all of the people on the phone today or listening into us today through their uh, laptops, computers, are, are very, very aware of these uh, factors. Um, but we wanna make sure that they're presented in this resource as a reminder. And also if you have new staff that you're training. And third, that you might come to a common agreement about what these terms mean. So you could have a staff meeting where you sit and say, you know, what do we mean by respectful? What do we mean by reciprocal? What do we mean by responsive? Before we put up these definitions um, that seem more formal. So you have conversations about what people feel themselves. How do they know they're being respected? What does a respectful interaction feel like? What does it sound like? So you can use these to kind of generate discussions among your staff and um, your partners even in the community to talk about what that means and how we're going to live in that manner that we show respect, that we value reciprocity and we're responsive. So I'll just take a minute to let you read what's on the screen here. We recognize and regard identities. We acknowledge the families have much to contribute. We come from a strengths-based perspective, of course. 
and we focus on the connections between ourselves and the families and the families with each other. So let's look here now at strategies for linguistically responsive outreach. So again, this is where we're reaching out to families, not making them come find us. So we might hire bilingual staff who can provide oral interpretation or written translations. We might provide translated materials. And this can be quite a challenge today. I live near Portland, Oregon, and we I work with a uh, child care and Head Start um, area of the city where they have 111 languages, 111 languages um, that they um, of the of the catchment area for services near the Portland airport. And that is an enormous, enormous challenge to have staff and be able and translators to be able to translate those materials to be um, fully ready to respond and be reciprocal with and respectful to families. So what they've done often is to find leaders in those communities that there are coming in um, to our to the Portland area and asking them to think about being consultants to their program to help with translation and to, uh, not only orally, but with translated materials. And several of the programs have really um, gone all the way with this in that they have added new members of the community to policy council. Um, they've maybe added new members of the community to come in to act as aides, to, uh, to be hired as aides in the program uh, so that children hear their own languages uh, as they come into child care and Head Start. The last one is lead efforts to increase the supply of bilingual child care providers by providing trainings in languages spoken in the community. And not only that, but looking out and starting new businesses, a small businesses or family child care can come by helping families understand that opportunity, um, the, the business model and how to start a small business is another way to engage new communities um, in uh, that are just immigrating into a setting uh, in the early childhood field. Here's another one. These are strategies continuing. Hire, bi hire bilingual technical assistance staff. Okay, goal. Of, think of that. Um, if we're able to, we need to translate materials. We also need to be able to put them into text messages, etc., in using um, culturally linguistic appropriate nuances. And then CCDF quality funds to train providers to work with families with limited English proficiency to offset that cost of translation. So here we have another beautiful colored slide. Here you see all six of the strategies. Um, and we're going to go through these a little bit differently this time. I want to think about what the Portland one that I mentioned to you earlier, that we have a whole bunch of families that have new families that have immigrated to our community because the airport is hiring. And that actually is what, what happened. Um, we had an influx of families, um, something like 30% increase of um, Somalian families um, that came to our community. And how were we going to make sure that we were welcoming and supportive and respectful uh, of, those, um, of those families as they moved into our community? So let's think about that as we move through these um, strategies. So here's the first one, compile community data to inform your outreach plan. Well, how did we learn that 30%, 20% of the families coming into moving into our area were of Somalian descent? Well, we found that out. Child care was partnering with Head Start on their community assessment. And they uh, shared that information and were able to both benefit from that cooperative community assessment process. And then another thing they might want to do is to plan collect data to track the progress. So we may have these high hopes of working with this new group that has just immigrated to our community, but how are we going to make sure we're doing the right thing? So you step back and say, okay, what do I want to accomplish? What data do I need to, to determine if I'm being effective? Family surveys may not work, right? But conversations with families making sure that we reach out to the leaders of communities and uh, involve them in an advocacy leadership role might be a possibility where we collect data. And eventually we might be able to work to a place where we could survey families and find out if our outreach efforts have been effective. Again, back to that sharing 
data is so critical in all of these efforts. Now, number two is really interesting. Create or enhance a language access plan to share relevant policies and procedures with staff. I don't know, I wasn't familiar with a language access plan. I apologize if it's my naivete, but I thought this was a wonderful part of this resource that they're looking at a language access plan. And so in this plan, we of course begin with assessment and we determine what the family's needs might be, those that are enrolled, those that are coming to our programs. And then what is our capacity to meet that need? Assessment of family's needs, assessment of our needs, our ability to meet that capacity. Looking at oral again, written translations, our policies and procedures, that's so critical. Do our policies and procedures reflect um, that respect and responsiveness uh, that we spoke about earlier? Availability of language assistance, staff training, and you can see um, quality assurance and compliance. So here we go, we'll look at the third one now. Translate program information into families' preferred languages. Here we again, we're thinking of this group that has just moved to, into our community in the last few years, and they're starting their own child care um, programs, and they're, they're in small businesses, and so we're thinking about ways to help them uh, create applications that provide uh, the uh, information to families in their preferred language. So we can do that over the phone, in person, or online through voice translations. That's when we were talking about that technical assistance earlier, voice translation feature. And as you translate program materials, use plain language translations, as Judy mentioned earlier, in the overview of outreach. Let's take a peek at number four. Of course, we've been mentioning that partnering, partnering, partnering. There's could be nothing more important than looking at our community-based organizations, except partnering with families. And again, it's having that respectful, reciprocal inter interaction that says, how can we know more about you so that we can then make sure that our services are respectful and supportive of your culture, of your values, of your uh, strategies for educating your children, of your parenting styles. We might want to also equip partners with information and materials about our programs. I know you all do that already. And you partner with community or neighborhood ambassadors. And that was mentioned earlier also by Judy, that we're looking at our neighborhood ambassadors or our trusted peers or leaders that we can turn to. Five is minimize and avoid requests for securities, social security numbers. Here we're going back to those policies and procedures you know, that may be hard and fast in your policy and procedures, and you may need to take a peek at that if you have a new influx of individuals um, where there may be a new opportunity for all these individuals to come into our community and be welcomed and respected. And um, one of the things that we might do is, uh, if we are requesting a social security number, uh, provide a clear explanation for why you need that information and how it will be used. And can you please, if you can, offer other options, such as unique identifying numbers? These all come from research, of course, on the best ways to support families. Um, federal policy does not require a social security number in order for families to receive CCDF child care assistance. That's in the new rule. And so we want to be really, really clear about that. And I know your states may be doing in different interpretations of that, but it's, again, modules designed to give you that feedback and that background information on which you can hang your hat as far as some of these policies. The last one is consider including in program eligibility requirements of family members participation in English as a second language classes. So here again, you're offering classes to families that are desirable, that find them desirable. Um, and that's um, that's part of the, of the of the services that you offer. Also consider paying particular attention to families who've been living in the United States for a short period of time. And that's been our example. We've been talking about it for the last few minutes. So that's a wrap up of the English proficiency resource uh, with limited English, families with limited English proficiency resource. And I hope this has been helpful to you in thinking about when you open that resource and hoping um, I've given you some ideas about how you might wanna use it. Nancy, shall I turn it over to you? 
Yes. Um, before we move on, Jennifer, I've been watching what's been uh, coming and going in the Q&A section, and there was one comment that I just thought was really important and worth sharing um, with everybody. Um, Heather wrote that shared understanding for staff and partners is so important because communication and language can be so complex, and we all have experiences that inform our understanding. And as you were talking, I was thinking how add on the layers of culture and language differences and how much opportunity there is there for miscommunication and misunderstanding based on assumptions or interpretations that come from our own lived experiences. So it's just a reminder that we all need to be aware and, and practice self-reflection and, <clears throat> excuse me, pay attention to, um, I think I'm catching your smoke, Jennifer, from Oregon. <laughs> oh, no, please don't. <laughs> And Heather, thank you for that really wonderful comment. And it makes me think also about the nonverbals, you know, because so much of our, yeah. you know, when we're not able to communicate verbally well, very well with one another, we also need to remember that some of our nonverbal communication is based on our, our cultural and values as well, or our interpretation, um, you know, so it's not just oral, but it's also nonverbal. Um, that makes that even deeper and more complicated, doesn't it, Nancy? Yes, yes, important. Parenting styles, even in you know how parents value education. I mean, there's just so such a breadth that we could spend the next uh, three hours uh, talking about this. But instead, I think we're going to move to families living in rural or remote areas. Hmm. Oh, we Thank keep, you. We keep re, re, we keep turning that around because we're used to saying rural and remote. I apologize. It's remote or rural. There you go, Nancy. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know as it matters, but you know, this conversation that we're having takes me back to that um, statement that Judy introduced in the beginning about it may not be that families are hard to reach. It may be that we are hard to reach or our resources are hard to reach, and. Again, it goes back to the issue of perception and interpretation. So, you know, when we say, well, we've blanketed a community with flyers and brochures, but nobody is contacting us. Maybe they don't care. Maybe they're not interested. Maybe this, maybe that. And we have to be very careful not to make those assumptions about people's behaviors, but to turn it back and look at ourselves again and say, okay, somehow we're missing something. What can we do different in order to really connect with people? And that's a lot of what I want to talk about in this section on uh, families living in remote or rural areas. And this actually is a, a topic near and dear to my heart. I live in a very rural state and we've had, you know, quite a, um, we've had issues related to this. And I would say coming from a strength-based perspective, opportunities to do some of that self-reflection and think about, so how can we be more effective? What is it that we're doing that's not connecting and how can we connect? So following the same format, here is the list of the six strategies. And again, I'm not going to read them off of this slide, but we, um, we're hoping through this webinar to kind of present you with a, a tease to encourage you to go and look at the strategies and uh, look at the resources, download them, find them online. Um, and there was a question earlier also if we would be able to repeat the link for the um, website where these can be found. And I think at the end we can put that up for people um, so you, you'll have it because we don't want you to feel that you have to be listening to this webinar and frantically and quickly trying to write down everything that's on all these slides or we know people take pictures of the slides, but this is all available in the resources and we want you to, um, we want you to get thirsty to go look at them and not just because it's a wealth of information, but what we're hoping to convey today is these can be very useful tools for you to look at circumstances and situations that you might be encountering in your programs or in your uh, in your work and say, oh, you know, maybe there's something there that can that can help me 
um, be more effective at what I'm trying to do. So I'm gonna go through these and, and maybe give you a few examples of some things. Um, you know, rural and remote areas definitely have unique challenges regarding outreach to families as well as to providers. Um, one example in the state I live in, we originally had uh, a CCRNR office, a presence in each county, and it could provide the training for providers, a place for families to come, and due to budget constraints over time, that had to all be consolidated into one central office in the state capitol, which is very inaccessible to many, many people living in the state. And it wasn't happy, you know, professional development for providers had to become online. Um, parents looking for childcare or looking for subsidy, looking for resources pretty much had to rely on the website. But the problem is a great amount of our state does not even have access to internet. So that, where does that leave people? And one of the things that we heard from providers in particular, it wasn't so much taking the training online, that was the challenge, but they really missed um, getting together with their peers in person. Now this has been compounded with the, um, obviously with the pandemic going on that we can't do those in-person things. So even more important that we figure out how to, how to reach people in a personable way, in a meaningful way, in a way that provides those um, or meets those needs that people are having for, for human contact, if nothing else. Um, so again, it's very important to collect data. Um, and some of these slides I'm going to give you a few questions to be thinking about. So when you're thinking about data, um, it's very important to know what is the makeup of these communities that you're trying to, to reach. Who lives here? What do they rely on for services? Where do they go for services? What do they need and how do they get information? So that's a lot of the data that you're going to want to collect and then based on that information, you can figure out how to allocate your resources, for example, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to give you a, an example of that a little bit later on. Um, you're also going to wanna know if your outreach strategies are effective. You know, we talk about the difference between effort and effect and we can all make a lot of effort, but if we don't know that we're making a difference, then we're kind of spinning our wheels, right? You're going to be um, thinking about recruiting providers in areas that have a low supply of quality childcare. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later too, because that's also a landscape that has really changed due to the pandemic. Um, and I mentioned about uh, professional development. So here that's talking about, and Jennifer mentioned this also in, um, the resources that she presented, it's very important to talk to families and ask them, um, what is it they need? What is important to them? But one of the questions you're going to have to think about is how are you going to go about doing that? How are you going to find these families in order to ask what it is they need and what they prefer? Um, do they prefer print resources, email, texting, social media, um, all of those different kinds of things. But it, but how are you going to find them? How are you going to talk to them? Um, you know, where I live, and I'm sure it's true in many places, word of mouth, conveyance of information is really important and can be a primary source of information and not just the source of information, but information that people trust. You know, they they tend to believe information that comes from friends and family over information that comes from outside areas. Um, you know, kind of a funny example I have is, um, I have three grandchildren and their grandfather on, on the other side of the family has a garage in a very rural area. And his garage is a gathering place of 
um, this crew of people that, that just hang out there, right? It's, it's the local hangout. And I'm telling you, that is New Center Central. So <laughs> that's, where, that's where you find out what's going on, who's doing what. And all of the news in New Center Central is really colored through very opinionated perspectives. But that becomes the reality. That becomes, you know, what is true to people. So you have to find those inroads. You have to find those people that are the conveyors of information and that are trusted. So it's, it's you know, it's one thing to say, go and ask the families what they want and need. But you have to think about how, how you're going to go about doing that. So um, this one kind of is, is along that same line, um, family decision makers, family leaders, who are those people? And again, this touches on what Jennifer was talking about with um, when you may have cultural differences and cultural differences doesn't necessarily only refer to people from another country, people that speak another language. I was doing a training one time with um, a group of childcare providers in this state where I live, which is, you know, very rural, very white, very, uh, and everybody says, oh, you know, we, we don't have cultural differences here. And one woman in the group, she, she said that. She goes, I don't know why we have to talk about this. We don't have cultural differences. So we started talking about the subtle things. You know, when you, let's say you get invited to someone's home that you've never been to before, and you've just met these people, and you walk in the front door, what do you do? You're looking around, you're, you're kind of scoping out how are things done? You know, oh, they have a white carpet. Oop, do they take off their shoes? Oh boy, um, sitting down at the table. Is there a special place where the dad sits? You know, all of those little things that that can throw you off and that can make or break the um, the initial relationship building. So, trying to understand what those cultural structures are, the decision making processes, and who are the respected family leaders. Um, you know, I love the way that this this one calls them gatekeepers and guardians for the families. And just very briefly, a, a wonderful story that I love that that one of our colleagues always shares when when she was starting out as a social worker and doing home visitors in a very rural southern state, and going up to a a little house down in the holler for the first time, and was greeted at the front door by the dad with a shotgun. Now, not to perpetuate stereotypes of rural people, but it was a little unnerving, she said. And she said she spent four months having home visits on the front porch with the dad with the shotgun. And she said, I totally respected because I understood Okay, the gatekeeper and the guardian for that family, he was doing to the best of his ability, his job to protect his family. And she said, after four months, I went one day and he invited me in and I knew I had done my job. I knew I had, I had been welcomed through the gate. So it's important to find those people and to respect the roles that they're playing and develop those relationships with them and think about who the family leaders in those communities are because they they can inform you as it says here give voice to the unique needs of a particular community um, what is it that the people need what might be some of the barriers to communicating that to you um, and how do you present, you know, even when we were talking about the issue of families experiencing homelessness, how do you pre present the opportunity for resources in a way that conveys respect for people's strength, resilience, and courage in all of the things that they're facing, as opposed to focusing on a need? And I, I have something that can help meet your need. Um, so I just think I just think that's a really marvelous perspective to be thinking about. 
Um, this one is talking about building partnerships with, um, again, local community leaders. And this was also touched on um, when Jennifer was talking about both families experiencing homelessness as well as the uh, cultural and linguistic diversity because the community leaders are the ones who, again, they know the people in the community, they know what's going on, they know the strengths, they know the needs. Uh, some of them might be faith-based organizations, often in uh, rural communities. Um, the church is the center, you know, of, of the community. That's where people go. So it's sometimes we have to think outside the box. What kinds of partners could we uh, form relationships with that will help us to to break through to the community, to communicate with the community. Um, child care providers are wonderful sources of information about um, what's going on with families in your community. What's happening? What do they need? Um, and assessing your agency's image in the community is another one that's really important. Um, you know, an example that I have about that is when, in my state, when the QRIS was first introduced, um, the reaction of child care providers was, oh no, here they come again with more rules, more regulations, telling us what to do, more paperwork, more record keeping, when we're already overwhelmed. And a lot of them just opted out because they just, they did not like the intrusion of additional rules and regulations, was, which is how they perceived it to be. And on reflecting about that, you know, people realized that they really should have focused instead on emphasizing how important is the role of a child care provider in the development of a child, right? In their social emotional development, their school readiness development, just their health, all of those things. How important is your job? You know, you are not a babysitter. And here's an opportunity for us to come in and support you in that important role to, you know, really focus on quality, help you do the very best you can do for these children and, and their families. And I think we would have had a, a completely different reaction and response to the QRIS than we did. It took a long time of um, kind of rebuilding the sense of trust and relationship around the, the QRIS and the, the state. So I thought that was interesting. But think about you know partnerships with other community organizations and maybe think outside the box a little bit. You know, 4-H programs might be a place to go. Um, local sports groups for for kids, those kinds of things. Now, this one is the one I was referring to when I said I'll, I'll talk a little bit about budgeting again <laughs> or resource allocation when we move on. It's really important in some of these rural or remote communities to show up in person for your outreach, participate in community events, become known, be seen, develop relationships, um, and again, I mean, many of us, we live, in a, we live in the communities already. We understand that, we know that. Um, but it's important, for, it's, it's important for leadership to think about, um, is there going to be costs involved in doing this? Is there gonna be a, do we need a travel budget? So for example, in my state where everything is centralized, it's important to get out. You know, our our northernmost county is it's so big it's known as the county. And some of you may know now which state I'm referring to. <laughs> I live in Maine, um, but we call our our northernmost county the county. And to get from southern Maine to the tip of northern Maine is probably oh an eight hour drive at least on a good day. But it's really important to get up there. It's important for those providers and for those families to to know that you know they're not they're not out there on their own. So, is it important to allocate a budget for travel for those kinds of things? Um, 
and how might it be easier for families to participate and for uh, providers to participate. However, as we all know, those in-person on-site visits are very limited right now. Um, so it is talking about telecommunication strategies. Um, and before I go on to that, um, Jennifer, did you have an example you wanted to share on something I was talking about? I think you might be on mute. Thank you, my dear. There, here I am. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I was you. thinking about the community partnerships and Nancy and I've had the privilege of being on many calls, listening to what's happening in various states as they adapt to um, COVID-19. And one of the things that New Mexico mentioned was they have a place at the table. They have a place at the table with education. They have a place at the table at the governor's um, discussions around services to children. Um, and they have a place at the table now with um, school districts. Um, because so often now that we're looking at school age um, children receiving more care, receiving subsidies, and how we support children who are uh, involved in virtual learning, suddenly child care becomes a very, very important cog in this wheel. And um, several of the states that I, I have the opportunity to work with have said how different it is today. It's a wonderful, valuable, asset that they've achieved um, through these terrible circumstances to really have a voice at the table to be seen as a vital and critical partner. And so when you were mentioning that, that, that came, kind of came to my mind. And I see CCRNRs as absolutely essential now as we think about services to essential workers, as we think about supporting providers who are so can be so isolated at this time, as we have people opening and closing. And I know you're going to talk about family child care in a few minutes, Nancy. But um, our, our place at the table in child care has been vaulted uh, uh, in many cases a hundredfold as we're no longer an afterthought. We are one of the first thoughts and a great asset to the community. So out of these terrible times, we do have that valuable um, um, outcome to think about as far as our, mm -hmm. uh, our mm -hmm. role at the table. Thank you, Jennifer. That's that's really that's a wonderful example and, and really important. So just real quickly, um, one of the strategies talks about um, telecommunication strategies. And again, you have to consider what is the capacity in your community? Do they have access to internet? Um, one of the things that we've discovered is that uh, in many of these areas, the internet is very sporadic or non-existent. Most people do have a cell phone or a smartphone or something like that. And so um, it's possible to use things um, like texting. I know our National Center has developed, I believe over the last year, um, text for families, so families can sign up and receive um, different texts related to uh, family engagement. Uh, there's there's an app called Text for Babies where expectant moms can sign up and um, get timely text messages about what to expect in terms of how the baby is developing, what they could be doing to get ready, those kinds of things. So there's a, there are so many um, smartphone apps now that can be used. So you might want to look into things like that to communicate with people if you can't do um, internet-based communication. And if you do have to do internet-based communication, I would just say that um, we are learning, and I'm hoping that we're getting better at being able to use this technology to connect with people, hopefully in a personable way. Um, not as good as in person, obviously, but uh, we're learning and we're getting better at, you know, really trying to be interactive and hear what you're saying in the in the chats or the questions and answers and, and have that communication going on. So really consider looking at different types of platforms for virtual communication and see how creative you can get with them. 
And then finally, strategy number six is another really important one. And we do know that family child care and family friend and neighbor care is very common in areas that are underserved by more organized child care, I guess I could say it like that. Um, and it's really important to think about what is available in the community and what could be provided to the community to strengthen those um, settings and improve the quality in those settings and build on the strengths of those providers as opposed to coming in and saying that, you know, you, you need to have more um, center-based care or whatever. And how do, you, how do you bring those providers into what I might call a network of support? Um, and how do you find out? So again, that's one of the questions, how do you find out? And one of the interesting things that we've learned about family child care during this pandemic is that, you know, for a long time, the concern about family child care was that it was shrinking. The, the numbers of providers was going down. And during this time of the pandemic, we're hearing, and I'm sure you are too in your roles, that the, um, the desire, the, the request for family child care is going up. People want their children in those smaller groups. They want them with a known and trusted provider. So family child care, the interest in family child care is going up and many, it seems that many more people are considering or opening family child care programs, whether it's formally or informally. So when I talk about bringing them into a network of support, um, again, how do you find out? How do you find out who they are, what's happening within a community, and how can you be there to um, ensure that the settings are adequate, that they're quality, that they're safe, that the providers are getting what they need to do the best that they can do, and that the families are feeling um, that they're getting what they need, that their children are safe, that they're being cared for. Um, so yeah, the, there's a lot. There's a lot to consider. So when you think about um, rural and, or remote areas, you know, I, I hope you'll think about these six strategies in a. I guess the word I would want to use is think about them in a creative way. You know, you can read it and say, "Oh, do this and do that," but you have to ask yourself. How? How can we do this in the most effective way? And how do we gather the data and the information that we need before we act so that we know what actions we take will be the most effective in the long run? So, um, and I do see that, um, I think, Judy, do you have something that you would like to um, clarify that came through in the Q&A? Sure. Thank you, Nancy. Um, Barbara had a, um, made a comment and she she asked if we could just please clarify the acronym just because we have a, a, um, a, a, the acronym CCRNRs and what they are um, because there are a lot of people on the call today, several hundred and some may may not be aware of what they are. CCRNR and we apologize for using the acronym and not you know, describing it earlier, but CCRNR stands for Child Care Resource and Referral Agencies. And Child Care Resource and Referral Agencies are either community-based, territorial-based in a community in terms of several counties, or they're a state-based ne network. And they provide resource and referral to families and to also businesses that contract with them to find available child care in their communities, whatever geographic areas that they serve. They also provide, very often provide other services in the community, uh, sometimes trainings for uh, to become a licensed family child care provider. They provide professional development uh, to child care networks, sometimes Head Start agencies, delegate agencies or grantees, if they have a contract with them. And in, they also, um, are usually very, very strong partners in the community, working with school districts and other businesses um, to make plans for the children and families in those communities. 
So Barbara, I hope that that, that helps. And thank you for bringing that up because that's, that's important. We had mentioned it, CCRNR is using the acronym in the poll when we started today. So thank you for asking us to do that because that's an important clarification. And Judy, you know, I'll just let them know too, we just finished up a series of webinars that were specifically targeted for CCR and our staff. So I think we may have gotten a little sloppy in the, just assuming yeah. <laughs> because that's been our audience for a while. It's true. So we appreciate when we get called out on that. Thank you. So I think um, that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to say. So I'm going to pass it back to Judy to, um, wrap us up here. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Nancy, and also to Jennifer um, for doing a, a great job of really um, walking us all through the, the full suite of resources from the overview document to each of the other three resources and the strategies that we may use. Again, um, I, I don't think I can't overemphasize this to all of you that all of this information is online. So um, at this particular time, I'm going to, I'm going to, Nancy's going to, and Jennifer will take a couple of your questions. We have a couple minutes if you'd like to um, type in the Q&A box. And I'm going to actually move to the next slide, although we are taking thoughts and questions right now because I want to display the links for all the resources because both Nancy, Jennifer, and I have referred to them earlier. And just in case you want to take a little snapshot or, or whatever of, of those, uh, they're all found on the CCTA website that I shared with you at the very beginning of the presentation. And besides a family outreach series, we also want to reference while you're writing in the Q&A box and Nancy and Jennifer may be looking in there to see if there's questions that uh, you would like answered. I'm also going to mention another uh, set of resources that also is a, a so rich with information. We've referred a lot today about relationship, relationship uh, based interactions and strategies with families and another great resource that you may want to look for also on the CCTA site, if you're not familiar with it already, is the suite of resources that are relationship-based competencies to support family engagement. And that is also a series of resources. Nancy, Jennifer, and I, particularly Jennifer and Nancy, have, have conducted many presentations um, and trainings to work with the relationship-based competencies and, and uh, think creatively how to embed them into the work that we do. So uh, between those two sets of resources, there's really uh, a plurithery of information to support what you're doing, to provide you with some validation um, of what you're already doing, and maybe also too to give you some creative ideas in terms of how to respin what you've been doing um, to better reach families. And again, um, all these resources really focus on that cornerstone approach that maybe families are not hard to reach, but our our services are are difficult for families to reach. I'm going to pause just for a moment and ask, uh, let's see, look at the Q&A box. I think we have um, answered just about all of the questions, but let's just give you a couple seconds here. We do have one that's outstanding. Of course, these are individual questions. And if you wish to share, put something in the Q&A box that you want us to share with the group, now's the time because we have a couple of minutes. Judy, I think um, Nancy asked that we maybe put the CCTA um, reference back up. Sure, we can do that. I can, let me just go back to, um, I have to pull up that slide and I can put that on the screen so folks can take a picture of that. It's at the beginning, so I'm clicking away here. You probably hear my, my sure. mouse clicking. And I'm, an, I'm answering Beth's um, Q&A, Judy, so you don't need to worry about that. Thank you. Beth. Let me see here. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna push this to the audience. Here's the total address for the website. Child Care TA, 
www.acf.hhs.gov. Um, you can search family engagement. The relationship-based competencies will pop up. The um, family outreach series will pop up. And that should take us to the very end. Just give a couple more seconds if anyone has any more questions. Just pausing for a second. So Judy, I just really wanna reiterate a big thank you to everybody that participated today and and yes. uh, hope that the information was helpful and encourage you to go to that Child Care TA website. Um, you'll find it's um, a tremendous source of multiple resources. So you, you have to do a little search, which is why we gave you the specific resources to, to search for in there. But it has information on available child care in, in all of the states, about QRIS in all of the states. It just there's just a lot of information for you to explore. So um, go and check out our resources and thank you for coming today. And hopefully we will meet again. Yes, thank you everyone. We, we stayed together as a, as a group pretty consistently for an hour and a half, which is a long time for a, a webinar. We all, but we also had a lot to share with you. Um, and on behalf of the National Center for Parent, Family and Community Engagement, thank you all for joining us. And Stay safe, stay healthy, um, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.